Hello, everybody. My name is Zach Ford. I am chair of the Dusty Baker Sacramento Sabre chapter, and I'm glad that all of you could join us this evening uh, for a great uh, discussion on Steve Geisher's new book. Um, I do have a few announcements before I'll pass it over to Marlene to do some announcements from her chapter. Uh, first off, uh, make sure to mark your calendars for November 14th. We're going to have uh, Lincoln Mitchell join us for another joint subcommittee or joint uh, chapters meeting um, to discuss his new book, The 100 Most Important Players in Baseball History. Should be a good evening. Um, we also will have our next uh, Sacramento uh, chapter luncheon um, at Folsom's uh, Riley Street Roundtable on December 6th. Um, on that particular meeting, we'll have election on leadership uh, and bylaws. Sabre is making a uh, encouraging chapters nationwide to do uh, elections for leadership positions and then also create bylaws just so they have a little bit of an inventory of what each chapter is doing. Um, and I am pleased uh, to announce so far uh, for uh, Vice Chair Tony Oliver has stepped up and expressed interest uh, in uh, running for Vice Chair. And then um, Steve Heath, um, who many of you may know, um, also is uh, interested in becoming the membership lead. So it'd be great to have those uh, positions filled. If anybody else is interested, obviously we'll do a election. If nobody else is interested, we'll end up doing by acclamation on December uh, 9th. Uh, but please put that uh, on your um, calendar. I'll make sure if you, you are interested, just please let me know if you are interested in one of those positions about a week before. Um, that way uh, we'll be able to prepare for the meeting uh, accordingly. And as far as the speaker goes for that meeting, to be determined. Um, selfishly, I must admit my book is supposed to be out by then, um, which is a collection. It's called up by McFarlane. It will be a collection of first person uh, player stories about major league debuts um, and call-ups. Um, if my book is not uh, available by then, I will ensure that you have somebody who is infinitely more qualified and more articulate than me as your presenter. But uh, please mark your calendars for that uh, luncheon. Um, and then also just a reminder too, uh, I included in the last email, the Lefty O'Doul documentary, uh, John Lee and Adakis would really love to spread the word on that. So we need to make sure that continues to go viral and uh, as many people as possible see that documentary, try to get them some funding and get more widespread knowledge of that particular uh, documentary. So right now, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over uh, to my counterpart uh, in the Bay Area, Marlene Vogelsang. Thank you, Zach. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Steve Treader and I are the co-chairs of the Lefty O'Doul chapter, and we welcome you. We enjoy these try to do it every month, uh, Zoom meetings with the Dusty Baker chapter. And uh, I think it's worked out quite well. Um, again, remember, save the date for November 14th uh, for a conversation with Lincoln Mitchell. I think we all probably, our 100 best baseball players, is everybody's gonna have a different list. So that should be interesting. Um, I also wanna let you know um, that last weekend's Sabre International Women's Baseball Center Women in Baseball Conference, the virtual conference uh, was uh, was another success. And uh, Sabre has, Jacob has posted those sessions on the Sabre website. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about women's baseball, women in baseball and its history, please take a look at the Sabre site. Um, also in my last, uh, our last uh, email to you reminding you about this meeting, we shared the news and you probably saw it on yes. Sabre this week in Sabre that Dick Beveridge passed away. And um, he was just a wonderful friend to Sabre and all of us, uh, just a wealth of baseball history and information. Um, Mark McRae, who chairs the Pacific Coast League Historical Society, um, we will be working with Mark and our two chapters to host a celebration uh, and member and uh, some kind of a memory meeting about Dick later this year. So we will be getting in touch with you 
when um, that information comes together. Um, if any of you are so inclined, I know Ray Beveridge, his wife, would love to hear from you. And uh, the address is in the Sabre directory. It's also in that last email I sent. So if you've got a minute and want to drop a line, I know they'd be they'd really like to hear, excuse me, to hear from you. Uh, so Steve and I and Pete McPhail um, will be working on bylaws and uh, leadership issues to follow along with what Zach shared about uh, uh, complying with what Sabre is trying to do to get all of our chapters to, uh, I guess, have a little bit more structure. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be sharing that information with you as it develops. But if there's any lefties on this call who are interested in getting more involved, please let Steve or me know and we'd be delighted to chat with you. So I'm turning this over to Steve Treder, who's who's with us from Tucson, Arizona. Thank Tucson, you, Steve. Arizona. And thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, Marlene. Tucson, Arizona, the, the home state of the first round winning Arizona Diamondbacks, I will I will hasten to remind <laughs> you. Um, Steve Gitcher is here. I assume most of you know Steve. Um, if you don't, you're in for a treat. This is really mm -hmm. going to be a, a just a great uh, discussion. He's such a interesting and entertaining presenter. He's going to talk about this wonderful, wonderful, amazing new book, uh, Baseball, the, the Turbulent Mid-Century Years. Uh, Steve Gitcher just won this year the Henry Chadwick Award. Um, from Saber, uh, such a great honor, such a such a, a appropriate honor. What many of you may not know is, in addition to all of his amazing body of work, uh, Steve really since the 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 nine conference that goes on every year here in Arizona, um, Steve is really one of the primary leaders behind it. It wouldn't occur the way it does every year so successfully without Steve uh, really being behind it, being a major part of it. So he's, his contribution goes far beyond just, just his own research and writing. He's, he's one of the great, uh, the great facilitators of all of us enjoying baseball um, the way we do. So Steve Gitcher, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We, Steve, stick together. Someday I'll get the chance to tell some nice lies about, about you. I appreciate it very much. I'm going to try to share my screen here um, so that you don't have to look at me. Uh, let's see. What do we need to do? Goodness gracious. Where am I going here? It'd be towards the center. That? There you go. There you are. Yeah, no, that's not that's not what I want. Oh. <laughs> what I want is this here. Here we go. <laughs> well, we got updated oh. on the Bears commander's score. Yeah, so I know. Going. God almighty. There. How's that? <laughs> nope. That's still what I'm seeing here. I know. It's. I would go ahead. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and if you go ahead and stop and maybe redo it sometimes. No, I think we, oh, there I we think go. Got, there you I go. Think You're up now. now. Yeah. Perfect. There. How's that? Perfect. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, one and all. Thank you for inviting me to speak to your uh, your joint chapter meeting tonight. I am honored and flattered to be here with you. You know. Writing a book is a work of arrogance when you think about it. Imagine having a thought or an idea and then asserting that others should be so interested that you should put that thought down on paper. Yet that's what authors do all the time. And we are grateful when anyone reads what we write. It's a high honor. Let me start tonight with a quick overview. My book, Baseball, the, mid, the Turbulent Mid-Century Years, is a scholarly work exploring the history of organized baseball during the middle of the 20th century. It examines the sport on the field and off the field and places its development as both sport and business within the broader contours of American history. The book combines narrative and analysis. It pays attention to most of the seasons across more than three decades while simultaneously exploring the sport's politics and economics. More broadly, this work is set 
against the great tumults of the 20th century, the Great War, the Great Depression, World War II, and the post-war transformations that define the decade of the 1950s. I want to do two things tonight. First, I want to tell you a bit about how this book came to be. And second, I want to give you a quick overview of its contents, what it's about. Let me begin by reading just one paragraph to whet your appetite for the whole thing. This is, uh, this is from the prologue. It's not, uh, it's not too long. Based roughly on the populations of the cities in them, four leagues qualified for Class A status in the minor leagues in 1903, the Eastern League, the Western League, the American Association, and the Pacific National League. Of these, the Eastern League was the oldest, tracing its lineage directly back to 1892 and less clearly to a pair of leagues that had begun play several years before. In 1903, the Eastern League played in eight cities, Baltimore, Buffalo, Jersey City, Newark, Providence, Rochester, Toronto, and Worcester, Massachusetts, a club that moved to Montreal in July. In 1912, club owners acknowledged the presence of the two Canadian clubs within their midst by renaming their league the International League. The second Class A League was the new Western League, formed in 1900, after Ben Johnson's Western League became the American League. This new Western League played its inaugural season with clubs in Denver, Des Moines, Omaha, Pueblo, Colorado, St. Joseph, Missouri, and Sioux City, Iowa. The American Association, the third Class A League, had been born an outlaw, but it proved more stable than any other minor league over the first half of the 20th century. In 1903, its clubs played in Columbus, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Louisville, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Toledo, and St. Paul. As sturdy as the American Association proved to be, the PNL, the Pacific National League, was just the opposite. Established in 1892, it joined the National Association in 1902 as a Class B league, rose to Class A in 1903, and reverted to Class B in 1904, its final seasons. West Coast fans preferred the Pacific Coast League, the PCL, an independent league that challenged the PNL and won. Enticed by two sweeteners, exemption from the draft, and a guaranteed place in the minors' highest classification, the PCL took the PNL spot as the fourth Class A league and prospered. Taking advantage of the West Coast climate, Teams played extraordinarily long seasons. 220 games in 1904 was the longest, but 200 was common, and even survived the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 by moving games scheduled there to Oakland. Okay, first, the origin story. From 1986 to 2008, I ran the research center at the Sporting News. Lots of Sabre members, including some maybe here today, use the research services we provided. In that capacity, I was once part of a panel discussion on the future of baseball research. In other words, where the field was at that time and where it was going. During that session, I met Dorothy Seymour Mills, the widow of Dr. Harold Seymour. Together, they had published two foundational books on baseball history. Baseball, the early years that takes the sport from its beginnings to 1903, when the two major leagues settled the differences between them, and baseball, the golden age that moves the story forward to about 1930. Later, of course, they added baseball, the people's game to complete the trilogy. At that session, at that panel discussion, I asked Dorothy what she would think if someone picked up the ball where she and her late husband had laid it down and wrote a solid narrative and analytical history of the game since 1930, without hesitation, she said this was a good idea. She heartily approved. But who would write such a book? I was well connected in the scholarly baseball history and research community, and I asked many people if they were interested in such a project. 
everyone turned me down. And nearly everyone had the same, said the same thing. Steve, you should do this. My first reaction was that these folks were crazy. I was not a professor. I had a full-time job and a family to raise, but I did think about it. And then one day I sat down to lunch with the late Dan Ross, then the director of the University of Nebraska Press. And together we hacked out the beginning of what became a book proposal. Once I agreed to submit a proposal, the first question was how to define the book chronologically. In other words, where to begin and where to end. The where to end question was easier to answer. I decided quickly that taking the story from where the Seymours ended to the present would be way too much. So I settled on 1960 as an end point. The reason is quite simple. 1960, as you know, was the last season in which each major league had only eight teams. 1961, I argued, when the American League expanded from eight teams to 10, would be the start of a new era. But where to begin? You can't just start. You need a place and a reason. As luck would have it, I found the necrology section, the obituaries, of the 1932 Spalding Guide called A Grim Harvest, an essay that noted the deaths of so many prominent baseball figures in 1931. Ben Johnson, his successor, Ernest Bernard, George Washington Bradley, who had pitched the first no-hitter in the National League, Jack Cheesebro, Jimmy McAleer, Charles Murphy, and Bonesetter Reese, an idiosyncratic physical therapist. Plus, before the year was out, Gary Herman had died, and Charles Comiskey, and Barney Dreyfus a few months later. So 1931 seemed to me to be a turning point, an end of something old and the start of something new. I recalled, too, one of the first adult books I read, Barbara Tuckman's The Guns of August, about the opening of World War I. It became my model. Tuckman begins her work by discussing the funeral of King Edward VII in 1910, the last time all the crowned heads of Europe, most of them related to one another, gathered together before the start of the Great War. Tuckman set the scene with her account of this funeral, and I tried to do the same thing with the Grim Harvest. And with that, I had my beginning. But really, not just where to begin, but how to begin, how to do the research. I was twice blessed. The first blessing was that I presided over the Sporting News Archives, a great research library with thousands of books and thousands of brown envelopes full of newspaper clippings. The second blessing was that I gained access to the note cards that the Seymours themselves had compiled for books they did not have time to write. The Seymour Collection is located at Cornell University, and I was able to go there to the Kroc Library and mine what I soon learned was a very rich collection. In addition, I had the benefit of the tremendous amount of research and publishing that Sabre members had done since 1971, the date of publication, incidentally, of the Seymour's second book. My book, therefore, would be a combination of narrative, that is the story of the game, and analysis, the why and the how. It would also be a combination of my own original research while incorporating the work of others, a project that academic historians call a synthesis. That's why the notes section and the bibliography are so long, some 74 pages. Does this sound a little dull? I think so. I kept in mind that I was trying to write for a scholarly audience and writing for a popular audience at the same time. I recall hearing historian David McCullough say, and here I paraphrase, history is not hurt by writing it in a way that someone may actually want to read it. So I decided early on 
to avoid the heavy language of academia and also to avoid simply telling the story of one blasted season after another. I mean, when you think about it, baseball has no plot. There's a beginning, sure, but there's no climax, no ending. There's always next year. And as a Mets fan, I know that better than most. The solution I found was two-pronged. First, I did not proceed strictly chronologically, season by season. Instead, I identified themes to each of which I return again and again as appropriate. Second, I decided to concentrate on people, to find one individual for each chapter, one person whose career encapsulated certain events and themes about which I wanted to write. So that's how the book came to be. That's the origin story. Now let me talk a bit about what it's about. Understand that I did not write a series of biographical sketches. Instead, the career of one individual winds in and out of each chapter during which I discuss the game's history, its politics, its economics, and its relationship with the rest of American history. I wound up writing a prologue and 14 chapters. In a sense, these can be divided into three sections, the Great Depression, World War II, and the post-war years. The prologue and the first six chapters which includes some considerable backstory, focus on the Great Depression and the persons profiled therein are Ernest Barnard, the second president of the American League, Connie Mack, Branch Rickey, Kennesaw Landis, Ed Barrow, and Larry McPhail. Here we look at such things as declining attendance during the Depression, downward pressure on salaries, reluctance to lower ticket prices, Contraction of the minor leagues, the advent of radio broadcasting, battles over farm systems, and the minor league draft, and various innovations like the All-Star Game, the creation of the Hall of Fame, and the establishment of numerous postseason awards. The middle section covers World War II. It homes in on Hank Greenberg, Don Barnes, the owner of the St. Louis Browns, and Yogi Berra. Here we see the reaction of baseball to the start of the war in Europe. FDR's green light letter, organized baseball's patriotic effort to contribute to the war effort while simultaneously trying to keep players on the field and spectators in the stands. The impact of the military draft, the pronounced decline in the quality of play, restrictions on spring training and travel, the change in the composition of the baseball itself, and the annual debate over whether the federal government would shut the game down entirely. The third part studies the post-war years, and its main characters are Tom Yawkey, Bill Veck, Red Barber, Ford Frick, Henry Aaron, and Bill Shea. Here we look at returning veterans, labor relations, race, demographic change, television, and the threat of government intervention. Plus, safer travel by air, old decrepit ballparks, problems signing young players more interested in attending college than playing in the minors, and the persistence of the peacetime selective service draft. It is a big book, admittedly, but I hope it is readable, and I hope it holds your attention. I hope, in short, that I have not been too arrogant. You can order the book directly from the publisher, the University of Nebraska Press, or from any bookstore. If you want a signed copy, send me an email and we can work it out. Let me conclude by reading after just one more paragraph, after which we'll be glad to have a discussion and to take questions. Here we go. In November 1954, San Francisco voters approved a bond issue authorizing $5 million for a big new ballpark intended to accommodate a major league team. The Pacific Coast League's dream to become a third major league was gone 
So the city's leaders had to decide whether to woo an existing team or wait for the possibility of expansion. Francis McCarty, president of the Board of Supervisors, made some informal inquiries to clubs that might be candidates to move west. New Mayor George Christopher, taking office in January 1956, was more aggressive. The campaign to attract a team gathered steam when Walter O'Malley revealed during spring training that he had bought Wrigley Field in Los Angeles and the PCL's Angels, giving him territorial rights in that city. McCarty approached Horace Stoneham in New York, and Christopher encouraged Los Angeles Mayor Norris Polson to bring the Dodgers to Southern California. Both mayors apparently agreed that getting two clubs to move would be easier than grabbing just one. In May, Christopher O'Malley and Polson huddled secretly in Los Angeles with Matthew Fox, head of a pay-per-view television company that O'Malley thought would solve baseball's television problem. A week later, the San Franciscans met with Stoneham in New York and convinced him that their city would be a better home for his team than Minneapolis. Commissioner Ford Frick tried to intervene, suggesting that baseball's internal politics required that the parties proceed cautiously. So Christopher was guarded when he told the press that the city would soon present Stoneham with a letter of intent outlining the terms of an offer. For two months, the mayor pressed his case. Stoneham called to testify before a congressional subcommittee and asked if he would move the Giants if a suitable proposition is made, said, quote, I would recommend it to our board, yes. The formal offer arrived, and on August 9th, the Giants board approved the move eight to one with only M. Donald Grant, a Wall Street broker, opposed. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Let me get out of here. There Steve, that was, uh, that was wonderful as I anticipated. You presented so, so entertainingly. It's not a, a dull, you know, textbooky kind of a book. It's a fun read. And I think your your technique of choosing one figure to be sort of the common theme for each of those chapters, which of course go into all kinds of different issues, legal issues and you know economic issues and all that other stuff. But the one figure, you know, kind of keeps the keeps the plot moving, keeps the pace of of the read up. Uh, it's just a very, very clever technique. I would like you to, I'll, 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 let's take questions here, folks. Type your questions into the chat um, or just raise your digital hand and we'll, we'll call on you. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, steal the first opportunity for question though, Steve. I'd like you to comment on the degree to which there's kind of a, a discrepancy, a, 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 a conflict in between in, in American popular culture so much of what, and it's certainly American mainstream baseball fan coverage, there's, we're presented with a sense that the 1950s were this kind of idyllic golden era. Everything was fine and perfect. Everybody was happy. You know, everything was great until, you know, O'Malley moved and the 60s happened and everything changed. When in truth, the 50s were anything but a calm and, and you know, non-turbulent time. It, every, it, things were already fast changing well before the 60s began. I, I'd like your, your thoughts on that. Well, that's that's certainly true, Steve. I am I am fascinated by the late 40s and the, and the 1950s, and I may do some more work on uh, on that period. Um, think think about. Um, Think about the large changes in American society um, that had an effect on everyone's life, but also an ef uh, effects on, on baseball. First of all, the American population was growing. Um, veterans came back from the war, got married, and had lots of kids. We call those people baby boomers. I'm one of them, born in 1948, and I bet there are some other boomers in the audience, so, so I can't see everybody's everybody's face. Second, secondly, the population was moving to the south 
and to the west. To the south, um, because of air conditioning, for one reason, and to the west, because that's where opportunity was, especially in the aerospace industry. Um, baseball, of course, was confined to the north and the east. Uh, as you all know, the most western city in the majors was St. Louis, and, and St. Louis and maybe Washington were the southernmost cities. So certainly as the population shifts, baseball has to deal with, uh, with that problem. Third, um, people were leaving the inner city and moving to the suburbs. That is, in fact, what my family did, and millions of other families did the same thing. My, my parents grew up in Queens, a borough of New York City, and I grew up in Nassau County, which is the first suburban county out on, uh, out on Long Island. Um, my dad was a Dodgers fan growing up. Uh, he could get to Ebbets Field um, by taking a combination of buses and subways. When we trekked to Ebbets Field, it was an hour and a half in a car through lots of traffic, and then where the hell are you going to park? Um, so he went to Evans Field about every two weeks. I went once a season. And that's a that's a problem for uh, for baseball as well. Um, um, and then may, maybe on a, on a macro scale, um, the, the most significant change is the development of uh, of television. Um, baseball had dealt with radio in the 1930s. Um, uh, for those of you who don't recall, baseball owners were at first extremely reluctant to put their games on the radio. And their argument was quite simple. If people can listen to the games on the radio, they won't bother to buy a ticket, to come out to the ballpark and buy a ticket. Of course, the reverse was true. People listened to games on the radio and they said, this sounds so interesting. I want to see it for myself in person. Um, the same thing happened, incidentally, when radio stations began playing records on the radio. The producers, the owners of the record companies said, if you play, if kids can hear our songs on the radio for free, they won't be willing to buy the records. And of course, just the opposite was the case. I don't care if I heard Purple People Eater a hundred times on the radio, I wanted my own copy so that I could play it when I want. So television comes along and teams are, for a variety of reasons, interested in putting their games on TV and television stations are hungry for product. They have to put something on the airwaves. And this perhaps has an adverse effect on baseball attendance. What baseball owners thought was that people were staying home to watch baseball on television. In reality, they were staying home to watch television. Baseball wasn't adversely affected because the Yankees were on TV. They were adversely affected because Milton Burl and Bishop Sheen were on TV. Television was mesmerizing. It still is. Go to a sports bar with your friends and half the time you're looking at them or maybe your phone and the other half you're glancing up at the screen even if it's a sport that you don't care about and two teams whose names you don't fully know. I mean, television is, is a mesmerizing medium and, and that was one of baseball's problems too. Add into that all of the individual problems, the angst of the 1950s, the effect of the Cold War, the fear that there would be a World War, a World war III or a nuclear war. And the 50s become a rather tumultuous time. I kid my, I kid my wife, I say, I said, Donna, you grew up on Leave it to Beaver Avenue because you didn't have to deal with any of this stuff. But of course, all of us did. So the 50s are not placid. And certainly in baseball, they are not a golden age. The 50s were a time of tumult, and that tumult had its effect on how baseball behaved. Thanks for the question. Boy, there's a lot in the chat. There's a ton in the chat. We'll get to the, every question. But before we get to the chat questions, uh, Dixie, Tourangeau has his hand up. Dixie? Ah, very good pronunciation. Very good. Muy bien. <laughs> if you gave me 15 minutes, I could probably come up with my copy of Purple People Eater. <laughs> there you go. I have three questions all related. Uh, first of all, how long did it take to write the book? Did one chapter present itself as the toughest to write as opposed to the other ones? And how many times did you say 
to yourself, why the hell have I gotten myself into this? Oh, well, the third question is the easiest to answer almost every day. I mean, any anybody who's written a book of any length um, asks themselves um, how how crazy were they when they uh, when they when they said yes. Um, Dixie, how long did it take? I'm embarrassed to tell you the truth, but you're a friend of mine, and so I will. The lunch I had with Dan Ross was at the Sabre Convention in Miami in 2000. So the book, from beginning to end, took 23 years. My my goodness. Um, which chapter was hardest to write? Um, the chapters at the end were harder to write because you've got to bring all these things together. You know, you've got all these themes, all, all, all these uh, uh, arguments that you've been making throughout the book, and you have to kind of wrap it, wrap it all up. Um, the, uh, the next to last chapter has as its focal point Henry Aaron, and that makes sense. But for the longest time, the focal point of that chapter was Dick Grote. Um, because he had been signed by Branch Rickey, and I thought that might be a, a good way to, but then, you know, I was leaving too much stuff out, and so I, I threw out, oh God, I threw out more than 100,000 words altogether, all, all and uh, and refashioned that one um, with, with Henry Aaron as its, as its focus. So I guess that was the hardest chapter, yes. Okay, let's get to some of the chat questions. First one here is about the Pacific Coast League, and it's um, endeavor to become recognized as a major league. Um, can you talk about that and talk about that? And it was happening just about exactly the same time as professional baseball was racially integrating. So it was kind of a yeah. kind of a collision there. Well, the, um, the the PCL uh, the PCL had integrated um, early on, I believe. Boy, I'm 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 a little foggy on this. But, uh, but it's after the war that the PCL, with Pants Rowland as president, really makes a concerted effort year after year, uh, in, in some fashion, to become a third major league. And uh, it's 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 Frick actually in the in the in the early fifties as commissioner, who comes up with a list of conditions that he knows the PCL can't meet. And when they meet a couple of them, he says, "Oh, and by the way, there are a couple more things you have to do." Um, you know, baseball owners were nothing if not conservative, and uh, and they would they would uh, stumble over a simple question like, "Well, gee, if we have three leagues, what will happen to the World Series?" I mean, if you can't come up with an answer to that question, how can you solve the really the really important ones? Um, so the uh, you know the the Coast League, uh, uh, it it just it's it's efforts to become a third league, um, just. Uh, just disappear. You know, um, some people remember that uh, that in 1941, uh, with the St. Louis Browns losing money year after year, the owner of the Browns put together a proposal to move his team to Los Angeles. That would have changed baseball history. He had a proposal. He had lined up. I wouldn't say he'd lined up the votes, but he'd certainly discussed it with other owners. And the American League was was scheduled to meet on Monday, December 8th, 1941. Well, of course, what happened on December 7th, 1941? You don't have to answer that. We all know the answer to that. So even Don Barnes voted against his own proposal. And uh, and, and and the major leagues did not, did not move west, even though the Rams had moved from Cleveland to, uh, that is the football Rams had moved from Cleveland to, uh, uh, to, to Los Angeles. Um, so in answer to the question, did the Pacific Coast League's ambition to major league status ever include black players? I don't think that was ever part of the discussion, you know, that the, that the PCL would be an integrated league. I, I, you know, I think the other problems, the other problems were so overwhelming that uh, that race was not even on the agenda. It should have been, of course, but it uh, but it wasn't. Marlene has a question. How did you decide who? would be the focus of each chapter? Well, that's a good question. Uh, some of these people were personal favorites. Um, I, I certainly wanted to write about Hank Greenberg. Um, as a St. Louisan, I certainly wanted to write about Yogi Berra if I could. Um, you know, I would I, as I was plotting out the book, and yes, there was kind of a rough outline 
that changed, I think, 1,500 times as we were going through it. But, but you know, one person appears to be the guy that uh, whose career kind of kind of embodies the themes I want to talk about. Some of these guys were unknown to me. Ernest Barnard was uh, was virtually unknown. I, I knew almost nothing about him. And his story is extremely interesting um, as Ben Johnson's successor, as a uh, as a, a, a dedicated baseball executive, a straight shooter a man who was running the business office of the Cleveland franchise in the American League in 19, what is it, 1908, when somebody bursts into his office and says, Barney, you got to come out and watch the game. Addie Joss is pitching a perfect game. And and Barnard says, sorry, got too much work to do at my desk. Can't go out and watch the game. Uh, so he missed, he missed, he missed that one. Um, Ed Barrow, I think, despite Dan Levitt's wonderful biography, is underappreciated. And he, you know, and, and he symbolizes the the the, uh, the, the evolution of the Yankees um, from a, from a team that had enough money to buy the players they needed, like Earl Coombs, or sign them off the off the sandlot, like Lou Gehrig, to establishing a farm system. Um, the argument over the farm system is basically an argument between the Ricky side of things and the Landis side of things. And when the Yankees, the richest team in baseball, say we're going to have farm teams too. Landis's point of view was dead in the water, um, so so that was that was pretty easy. Um, McPhail, you know, um, present at at the creation of so many things: uh, uh, radio, television, night games, um, ushers in fancy uniforms, um, ushers who actually were polite to the fans who were filing into the stands. So he had to be included. Vec, I'm sure, had to be included. Um, uh, wasn't too hard. Um, Bill Shea, well. Uh, you know the the movement for the Continental League, which is the real impetus for for e expansion. Um, um, so that's how I that's, that's how I handle. It. I think I'm 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 pretty I'm pleased with the people I picked. I don't think after the fact I would I would change any of it. M maybe you know Steve, you've read it. Maybe there's a weak link in there. Um, if there is, please don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say I love what I love about the list. Yeah, there's Hank Aaron and Hank Greenberg and Yogi Berra, you know, some famous star players. But then, yeah, there's these sort of Ernest Barnard. I had never heard this guy's name. You know, yeah. it, it 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 becomes a list of names that I never would have thought to put all those all those names on the same list, and yet it 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 works. It's a it's a it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, related question: uh, Can you share with us? Is there anybody in your short list of names who didn't make it, who who ended up on the cutting room floor? Well, I, I mentioned Dick Grote, and I think really he was he was the only one. I do, I don't think I made any other false starts. Um, you know, the the chapters are long. Um, this is a long book. There's no question about that. I hope I hope it's lively, but they are certainly long. And so as you're as you're writing one chapter, you are thinking ahead. You know what's 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 going to happen next. Who's going to be the centerpiece? What do you want to talk about? Who do you want to talk about? Who works? Who doesn't work? Um, and it, it's it's so it's not a question of ending one chapter and then saying, well, what happens next? You know, you've already been thinking about that for some time. Um, so besides growth, you know, I don't think anybody wound up on the cutting room floor. Any person, of course, a lot of stuff wound up on the on the you know um I, i'm i'm not sure i'm a good writer but i think i'm a pretty good rewriter and i uh i hacked away at this um for a long for a long time um i like i said earlier i cut one hundred and ten thousand words from what i thought was a pretty good manuscript and uh, and after i did so um it became in my opinion an even better manuscript i hope i hope others agree I I think you I think you, it's a big thick book. It's a, there's a lot of substance here, um, but yeah, the, the 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 narrative pace it moves along. You don't get stuck. It it, it well, it's a it's it's a quick read for for something as massive as it is. Yeah, Steve. Uh, let me before sure. we take the next question. Let sure. me also say that I think it's a really pretty book. <laughs> it's a beautiful illustration. I, the, the dust jacket is 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 gorgeous. This is a this is a painting by a Sabre member named Greg, named after Greg Nettles, Greg Kreindler. Um, he gave us, I, 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 wanted, I wanted something that kind of evoked the period. This happens to be a picture of 
respect to Robinson sliding into home plate. It is not the home plate, you know, the, the World Series steal of home. That's Andy Semenek of the Phillies. But it's it's no game in particular. It's just an action shot that I think speaks to the era. Uh, Greg gave us um, permission to use painting. Um, unfortunately, the painting is based on a photograph that's owned by Getty Images. So we had to compensate Getty for the use of the photograph. And then the designers at the press took that painting and put that red baseball pennant underneath it with baseball in big letters. And uh, I had nothing to do with the design, but boy, I think it really pops. And I'm so, I am so happy and so grateful to them. One of the reasons some of us old fogies still love physical books um, is among the great things about physical books is it, it's a, it's a, it's got a front and a back and it's a, it's a pretty thing to look at. It, it's a, yeah. And if you take the dust jacket off and put it on a bookshelf in a library, the word baseball just pops right out at you. <laughs> baseball. Yeah, there you, yeah, there yeah. you go. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Tom Still about uh, the racial integration. A, a, a interesting question. What happened to the umpires, coaches, managers, scouts, and accountants and such who'd worked in the black, black leagues players. when when they when they faded in the fifties? What happened to them? A few got hired in Major League Baseball, but very few. We all know Buck O'Neill. Um, a couple of others probably became coaches or scouts. Um, Outside of that, um, they lost their jobs, so far as I know. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert uh, in uh, in this area. If anybody else knows the answer to that question, speak up, please. But I suspect, you know, no no umpires from the Negro Leagues were hired. Emmett Ashford comes much later. He was not an I I don't believe a Negro Leagues umpire. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But coaches, managers. Talent, talented people, absolutely. Um, they were out of work, at least at that level. The only major yeah. league, well, maybe a couple others, but the Giants um, in corp, the Giants hired Alex Pompez, and Alex Pompez yeah. brought a bunch of his scouts with him to join the Giants. But that's you know that's one uh, uh, Negro League owner. Uh, most of them, uh, the you know the the story of racial integration is a, is a great American success story. But it's got another side to it, which is that thriving, thriving business enterprise been going on for decades, you know, was destroyed. Yes. Right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, here's one you you I think you might have some interesting things to say about National League owners seem better to adapt to change than American League owners. Uh, is that accurate? And if so, why? Why? Oh, I I think you might be able to pick out individual episodes where National League owners um, were a little bit more adept than American League owners. But it, it, in the main, I think both leagues um, had more than their fair share of, uh, of conservative, uh, let's sit on our hands and, and, and keep doing things the way we've always been doing them. Um, I mean, when Ford Frick becomes commissioner, uh, he becomes famous for saying, you know, when anybody asks him a question, well, that's a league matter. And yet the National League was in the hands of Warren Giles. Remember him? No, not much. And the American League was in the hands of Will Harridge, who had cut his teeth in the uh, in the American League office, uh, working on the train schedules for teams traveling during the season. Um they uh, those those two league presidents, I don't think were uh, were nearly dynamic enough to shepherd their leagues through the tumult of the of the 1950s. Um, uh, you know, when you when you think of the great issues, uh, television um, before that, uh, the war, um, night baseball, um, some owners are, are relatively progressive. Um, most uh, most are not. You know, um, you know, there, there's a, 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 a famous story when Hank Greenberg becomes general manager of the Cleveland Indians in the early 1950s. And he starts talking about moving in some way, moving to the West Coast. 
And Clark Griffith, still alive, barely, um, the owner of the Washington Senators, says, Henry, don't go out there. It rains all the time. And Greenberg says, Mr. Griffith, when is the last time you've been in California? He said, I pitched out there in 1904. Half century. <laughs> That I think personifies, you know, the the uh, uh, the conservatism and the utter lack of imagination on the part of uh, on the part of these people. But it is fair to characterize, though, that with the way the two leagues went about expanding, I mean, the American League, the National League didn't didn't do everything right, but the American League did just about everything wrong in, in right their expansion. Right. Yes, yes. Um, well. Um, you know the, the the National League had its its real leader in I think Walter O'Malley, and uh, and uh, assisted in a certain sense by by Stoneham, and of course Perini had moved the the Braves from Boston to Milwaukee. Um, the American League stumbles and stumbles and stumbles. Uh, you know Andy McHugh's wonderful book, Stumbling Around the Bases, um, talks talks all about this. And when the leagues were, you know, when they finally took the Continental League proposal, a proposal for a third major league and squished it, um, the American League says, well, we'll expand, we'll expand. And the National League says, forget it. We're, you know, they make their announcement first. And they grab Houston and, uh, and, and put a team back in New York to replace the Dodgers and the Giants. And the American League's caught with its pants down um, one, one more time. And that's a a little surprising because Del Webb, the owner of the Yankees, was probably richer and more powerful than anybody in the National League. And yet he, he was not able to exert the kind of leadership that O'Malley and Stoneham did in, in, in the National League. Yeah. Tom still says O'Malley was smarter than the others. Yes, I think that's true. Um, yeah, absolutely. The National League um, racially integrated much faster than the American. Uh -huh. Um, the Dodgers, right. of course, were first, but then the Giants, the Braves, the, Giants. the Reds, they, yeah. they were much more uh, assertive about that than other than Cleveland, just about any American League team until. Yeah, that's that, that's that's right. You know, the National League has had its uh, its its laggards, the Phillies in in particular. But if you look at the end of the decade and, and look at all star teams, um, most valuable players, Cy Young Award winners, batting champions. The National League is is beginning to show the effect of uh, the wonderful effect of having African Americans play in their league, and the American League has has hardly any. You know, Bobby Avila, um, Minnie Minoso, Larry Doby, but the stars, you know, the National League, Mays, um, uh, Cepeda, to name just uh, two, Ernie Banks, Frank Robinson, just uh, Henry Aaron, of course, an yes. incredible cast incredible cast of uh, of all-time greats um dixie chime on in i in spite you were saying how long the book is i think you've sold me on it. well thank you so, so let's get that out of the way first all right but secondly I, i'm sure you will learn hundreds of things in 20 years that you didn't know were there but can you think of one or two things that were so shocking to you that it kind of threw you back in your chair when you did find out about them? Yeah, good, good, good question. Um, I, I certainly had to learn a lot about the business side of baseball, um, the history of the draft and all of its convolutions, um, draft exemption. And how the draft worked not only with the major leagues drafting players from the minors, but minor leagues drafting from leagues in the lower classifications. All of that is uh, is extremely complicated, and I'm not sure that I did it justice. You, you know, the uh, uh, the academic Jacques Barzon is famous for saying, "If anybody wants to know baseball, excuse me, if anybody wants to know America, he should understand." baseball. I would say if anybody wants to understand America, he should know minor league baseball because that's where the game really changed on, a, on, a, on an annual basis. And we have no history of minor league baseball. If I were 40 years younger, 
and had a tenured position teaching sport and baseball history in a research university, my graduate students would be churning out theses and dissertations on the minor leagues. Um, now, uh, to answer Dixie's question more directly, um, I try not to make judgments in the book. I try to lay out the facts, so to speak, and let people come to their own conclusion. But I think what I learned, and maybe this was su surprising, is, is how little power Kennesaw Mountain Landis really had. I mean, he's, he's famous as being an autocrat with that white hair flowing, you know, and his, and his chin on his, on his fist. And he's famous, of course, for his actions vis-a-vis -vis the Black Sox right after, the, right after they were acquitted at trial. Um, but I'm not sure he had any other major victories. Um, he lost on the that, farm system. Yeah, he lost. He lost big time on the farm system. You know, now he's famous for freeing some free agents every now and then, the Cardinals and the, and the Tigers and whatnot. But uh, and and he's not. Uh, you know, he's not particularly a, a forward thinker. Um, he's an adjudicator in in many ways. Um, not uh, not not a leader. You know, I mean, we all have our own opinions about current commissioners. But they are the leaders of the game, and I'm not sure that Landis really was. So in that sense, yeah, that was a, that was a surprise. That was that was new. Yeah. Any other uh, questions that we have missed over here in the chat? Did I overlook anything? Uh, I hope well, your he, reads he, great, he, just like you're talking. But, well, I hope I you know. I, I hope it does too. It's um, writing is hard. Um, rewriting is harder. Um, trying to find a voice, you know, is does this sound like me? Um, does this is is this what I want to say? Um, and if so, will anybody want to read it? Um, <laughs> who's your who's your audience? Um, who are you writing this book for? Um, do you have to? You know, do you have to, quote, dumb it down for school kids? Um, are you writing to people who aren't baseball fans? Are you writing for people who are baseball fans? It th Those are tough questions. And you make those, you know, you make those decisions all the way through. I mean, most prominently, you know, I, I think if you ask the average American, <clears throat> what one story do you know about 20th century baseball, the middle of the 20th century, they'll say Jackie Robinson. And of course, there are a tremendous amount of, of good books on Robinson. So when I get to that story, how much of it do I have to retell? Um, what kind of judgments do you make? What do you put in? What do you leave out? What do you assume that people know? What do you assume that people don't know and have to be told or maybe told again? Um, you, you make those choices all the way through. And then to make it readable beyond that is... Uh, it's it's a real it's a real challenge. I admire anybody who's written a book. I used to, you know, when I worked for the Sporting News, I think for eight or nine years, I uh, I reviewed books, and and I was smart enough to understand that any book is a massive effort. So be kind. <laughs> that is a well put statement right there. Any other questions that anybody wants to have for Steve before we wrap it up here? Then I will just say on behalf of the group, thank you, sir. Thank you. What a what a wonderful time and interesting conversation to have. Um, I I've you know I I've read it. It's an easy, fun read that you keep going back to because there's a lot of real substance there as well. So congratulations, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your questions, everybody. I really appreciate it. All Thanks, right, everybody. Have a great night. Okay.